right, so we are back for another Q&A session, answering more of your questions, giving you my opinion. And again, I'll say this every week. My opinion is my opinion. Doesn't make it right. It could very well be wrong. Your job is to tell me what I'm missing because a lot of the opinions and research that I do are based on the dialogue that we have together. So leave a comment and tell me what you think about these ideas that I have and tell me, you know, am I right? Am I way off? Where am I compared to your opinion? And let's dialogue on it and, and find out what the middle ground is and what, what, do we, what can we come to an agreement on. Now, last week I tried the clock. I had the clock over my shoulder with two minutes on it. Now, for better or worse, I'm long-winded. And because I'm long-winded, because I have lots of opinions, because sometimes I kind of, you know, take a while to get there, um, I didn't feel like with the clock ticking that I could fully answer the question all the time. So the clock is gone. I'm killing the clock. The clock is no longer a part of this because mm, if you're not interested in what I'm talking about, you could fast forward to the next question. But I got to be able to really elaborate on my thoughts because that's the whole point of doing this in a video instead of on comments. So again, five questions that you guys submitted to me. We'll go ahead and start with question number one right now. If you could go back to your past and talk to your young self, what advice would you give yourself? Would you change any of your collecting habits and what were they? All right, now that's a really good question. Now the first thing I would say is I'm assuming we're talking about me as a collector, right? Not uh, what would I change about my past w with everything involved. But if we're talking about collecting, um, you know, I was one of those weird kids. I bought a 61 Eddie Matthews at a card show when I was like nine. And I was buying George Bretts and Robin Younts in, you know, uh, 1993 when, you know, those guys were kind of at the tail end of their career as I was starting to pay attention. So I've always been into the vintage thing and older cards and historic, like higher end players that were at the end of their career and not really gotten caught up in that whole, you know, rookie sensation stuff. So if we're talking about card collecting, I would say the thing I would tell my young self would be don't stop. I stopped collecting from, um, I collected a little bit during college, uh, mostly through high school I was doing it a little bit. But then I stopped for several years and I would say don't stop because this is a hobby that doesn't have to be expensive. Um, it's a hobby that you can do in your spare time easily and not be, you know, giving up valuable time with others. So I would definitely say I wouldn't have stopped collecting. That would be the advice I would give myself. What I think that you're probably getting at though is what advice would I give to a young collector? And the advice I would give to a young collector would be this. Don't get caught up in the hype of the new hot rookie. The, the ups and downs of rookies and prospects is insane. I'm, I remember pulling a Greg Jeffries 88 Fleer card out of a pack thinking I had just won the lottery. And that card's not very expensive anymore, right? Uh, ben McDonald rookies were the rage for a minute. And they're not anymore. You know, we look at guys like Trey Lance and Tua. I mean, Tua was this way uprise and then this huge plummet and then this uprise again. And now what's going to happen with this health? So I would say go with established players the literally the glitter and the glitz and the the look of the new cards is unbelievable it's like looking at i mean they're they're incredible but i don't see long-term value in them i was literally at a card show and i'm going long on this one but i have to tell this story i i was at a card show the other day and this kid was negotiating with a dealer and he said, hey, would you take 15 on that, um, 
the Ant-Man card. And I'm like, 15 for Anthony? I, what are we talking about? And he goes, no, I'm at 16.5. And I'm like, is he talking about $16.50? This kid was like 10. And he goes, the kid goes, no, the best I could do would be 15 on it. And I'm like, they're talking about $1,500 for this out of 25 auto card. And my mind, like, like my head was going to explode. First of all, that there's this kid who's 10 walking around with $1,500 to spend on cards. Number two, that he would want to spend $1,500 in cards on that. I mean, he could go buy a Cy Young card. He could go buy, you know, a rookie Harmon Killebrew and Reggie Jackson and Ricky Henderson. I mean, there's so many ways that she could spend $1,500. And we don't even know if these prospects are going to be around in a couple of years. So my advice would be, there's a huge demand for prospects now. But will there be a huge demand for those guys in a few years? It is literally playing a slot machine. It is literally pulling the lever on a $50 slot machine versus putting it into the S&P 500. Vintage is the S&P 500 and buying, you know, the Obi Toppin cards or the Ant-Man cards or the Tua or the Trey Lance cards are, are literally pulling a slot machine. So my advice to a young person would be go with the proven thing, go with the established card, not with the, the risk. It's not worth it. What are your views on sports card autographs? Like them? Collect them? Does it take away some of the appeal of a vintage card? So I, I really like sports card autographs. I, I'm really into them, both in person on an older card or the cards that come out now that are signed by the players and you know verified by and certified by Panini or Topps or whoever. I have a pretty big autograph collection. I'm a through the mail guy. I've been doing through the mail for a long time. And, you know, a lot of people have asked me, hey, share some more of your collection. We want to see what you collect. And I'm like, eh, why would anybody want to see what I've got, you know? And occasionally I'll show some stuff. So I'm going to use this opportunity to answer that question. Big on autos. Um, I'm big on current autos, old autos. So I'm going to show you some. Arnold Palmer. Got that at a... Uh, Senior PGA event when I was about 12. Juan Marichal. Juan Marichal. That was free through the mail. Actually, I think he charged 10 bucks. Willie McCovey. Willie McCovey, I got at a mall show with my dad when I was about nine. When I was a kid, I was doing through the mail autographs. Got Mike Schmidt through the mail as a kid. Recently, Lee Trevino signs through the mail for free. Lee Trevino autograph. Tom Watson signs through the mail. So I got a Tom Watson autograph. Um, I've gotten other guys, Goose Gossage, Ryan Sandberg on his rookie card, Wade Boggs on his rookie card, Mike Mussina on his rookie card, Jose Canseco, that was the Grail card as a kid. He even put 4040 on it. Dan Fouts. Mario Andretti. Richard Petty. John McEnroe. And then, oh, one more. Robert Parrish. Now, those are the on cards that are, you know, older cards that I then had signed. But I also like a lot the cards that are coming out in packs, the insert cards that have autographs. I have this Ozzy Smith. I've always liked Ozzy Smith. I was a middle infielder as a kid, so I always looked up to him. We went to the same college at Cal Poly, so I'm a big Ozzy Smith guy. Bill Walton. And these are so affordable, it's unbelievable. In fact, I'm bidding right now Hakeem Olajuwon. 
I'm bidding right now on a um, Bob Gibson. You can buy a Bob Gibson autograph for like $40. Bob Gibson, one of the best pitchers of all time. I don't understand. Jerry West is one of my favorites. This is in a video negotiating to buy that one. Oscar Robertson, you know, one of the best who ever played. And then probably the prettiest one. Dr. J. Look how cool that autograph is in the gold. So yeah, I'm big into autographs. I'm big into the autograph inserts, but I'm not big into, you know, Trey Lance. And I'm and I'm why do I keep saying Trey Lance? Well, I'm a 49er fan, so there's all the Trey Lance talk all the time. I'm not into the prospect guys. I'm not into even though there are some really good players. Pat Mahomes is awesome. You know, Joe Burrow is awesome. Those don't excite me as much as the kind of legendary guys that have the insert cards. So yes, I like them. I think that they have value potential, but quite frankly, I'm not buying these to potentially sell. I'm buying these because I like collecting them for me. What is your least favorite card design of all time? And what is your favorite card design of all time? All right, least favorite card design ever. I think I have to go, there were some bad ones in the early 90s, probably the 91 Fleer. Pretty sure it was the 91 Fleer with the yellow border. Those were awful. And not just was the border awful, um, but the 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 photography was was weak. It was like... They were just trying to slap cards together and get them on the production line, and they produced a ton of them. I can't think of what the most valuable card in that whole set would be. There's nothing that could be worth more than a dollar. Um, those were awful, absolutely awful. My favorite card design ever is a really, really tough one. Um, I like a lot of the sets in the 50s. I love the 54s. I love the 52s. Um, but I think I have to go the 55 um, and I'm going to show you a few over my shoulder here, but yeah, I mean, you got Killebrew's rookie that year, Sandy Koufax rookie, Roberto Clemente rookie you've got, but the, I like how it's got the landscape, how they're horizontal. I like how it's got the action thing in the background, but a nice close up, really legendary, iconic card of, uh, Jackie Robinson in that set an awesome Ted Williams in that set. There's a lot of really, really good cards. The only downfall with that set is that there are some missing players, right? Um, you know, there's there's no Stan Musial, there's no Mickey Mantle. Um, so that would be the issue. But as far as the design goes and the actual look of the cards with that colored background, I mean, another one that pops into my head that's a really cool looking one is the Ernie Banks. So I would say those cards... I like the look of and the style of the best out of any one, out of any. Um, and I know a lot of people don't like the landscape. They don't like the sideways card, but I like them. 55, 56, 60. Those, those to me are really cool cards. So uh, yeah, 91 Fleer is bad. 55 tops is probably number one. I hope you'll consider subscribing to my channel. Do you think SGC will eventually pass PSA values as it is pretty much common knowledge that they are more consistent in their grades, quicker turnaround times, and customer service, etc.? So it seems like consistently we're all interested in the whole grading thing. And I know a lot of the people who subscribe and watch my channel specifically are vintage collectors and so um and there are a lot of vintage cards in sgc holders so i understand that a lot of us have a lot of hopes that sgc values will catch up and pass psa um, again i have some sgc cards most of my cards are in psa holders i have submitted to both I think both companies have a lot of pros and cons. I've done a lot of videos of comparing the values of the two. And if you've not checked those out, I hope that you will consider checking those out. 
What I have found based on my research and based on looking at numbers and crunching numbers and putting numbers of sales into spreadsheets and analyzing it is that on the lower end cards, the, as far as the lower end grade, the ones, the twos, the threes, the fours, it doesn't seem to have that much difference in value from SGC to PSA. But when you get into the premium cards, uh, the grades of seven, eight, nine in cards, the vintage card market, it does seem no doubt about it that the PSA cards have substantially higher value. So will SGC catch PSA? Again, I think they can. I think it's possible, but I think it's going to be very difficult. And the reason it's going to be very difficult is because of the number of eights and nines and sevens that are already in PSA holders. And I had somebody reach out to me a week or two ago and they said, what are you talking about? The most expensive card that's ever sold was the 9.5 SGC Mantle. That's the most expensive card that's ever been had a transaction recorded on it. And that's an NSGC holder. So how can you say the PSA cards are more expensive? Well, the reason I say that is because the majority of the eights and nines in vintage cards are in PSA holders, not SGC holders. Do I want it to be that way? No, not necessarily. Now, I don't really care. I've had people that have gotten on my case and, and left comments about how I'm in the bag for PSA or I'm in the bag for SGC. I'm not. Um, people have accused me, well, you're just supporting SGC because they're paying you. I can tell you for a fact, I've not gotten a dime from SGC. I'd love to get a dime from SGC. If they want to hire me to consult with them, I'm all, I mean, hey, email me. I'm interested. But that's not happened. So I just give my opinion based on my opinion and things that I think would be helpful. I do think SGC could catch PSA. It's not a short-term uh possibility, but I do think it could become a long-term possibility. How could it happen? I really feel for that to happen, a lot of people would have to start moving their stuff from PSA holders to SGC holders. When I go to a show and I look in a case and there are graded cards and in vintage cases, 80% of them are in PSA holders. If 80% of them were in SGC holders, then I think that that would that would show that SGC is the preferred company. Uh, as far as the turnaround time, SGC is killing PSA. Costs, they're kind of close. Customer service, SGC is killing PSA. Marketing, I think SGC is killing PSA. Every time I turn around, I see the CEO of SGC on another you know, blog, on another website, on another interview on another YouTube channel, um, but I've never seen anybody from PSA. PSA had a huge lead. P uh, SGC is catching up. PSA has been living off of their huge lead, and I don't think they've been very creative with their actions, and I, in a lot of ways, hope SGC uh, catches up and passes them. Whether they will or not will depend on the actions and the moves that they make. I think a really cheap cost to take PSA slabs and cross them over into SGC would help them a lot. I think continuing the quick turnaround time. I think expanding, creating, and actually establishing their set registry and really putting money into it. Put it making a really good app that uh, similar to what PSA's app has would do a lot. Um, but I agree that SGC is more consistent. They're faster. They're pretty much more affordable. The one place they're lagging is on value. And so they have to find a way uh, to get everybody to be anti-PSA. So um, I don't know. They're going to have to get creative with marketing. It could happen. I don't expect it to happen soon, though. So we'll see how that pans out. I'm going to continue to monitor it. I'll continue to post videos if I see changes in it. 
But in the same in the meantime, PSA still ahead as far as values go. What's your take on Venezuelan and OPG vintage '60s baseball cards? Okay, so my take on OPG and Venezuelan cards. Now, I did that video recently on supply and demand, and if you watched it, um, and I hope that you did, if you haven't, look up the supply and demand video. Um, the title is about, you know, predicting the price of cards and the value of cards, and you can find that out using supply and demand. One of the main points of that is, you know, if the supply of any card is low, it has a much better chance of high, having a higher value. And, you know, there are years that they had the OPGs. They did them a lot in the 80s. Um, you know, a lot of the hockey cards, like the, the Grail Gretzky is an OPG in, instead of the tops. But I, I think, what was it, the uh, 71 tops uh, has an OPG set. There's a lot of them out there. The Venezuelans, a lot of those are earlier. Um, so the, as far as what do I think of them, I think the supply is significantly lower. Um, but then for the value to be significantly higher, there would also have to be the same amount of demand or a higher, you know, equal or higher demand as well. Um, and I don't know how much demand there is for those. I don't look and go, oh, I got to pick up some Venezuelan cards. But when you see them, you're kind of like, oh, that's cool. That's different. I know there are some people that are really into them. I know that there are some people who really enjoy collecting rare stuff. And I'm not really into rare as much as I'm into stuff I like. So if I was an investor... If I was somebody who was buying cards that were hopefully going to go up in value, I think those have a, a pretty good chance of going up in value just because of how rare they are. But if we're talking about collectability, to me, um, I don't go, oh, this one's an OPG and this one's a top. So I want, that. I don't like look out for those sorts of things. So I don't seek rarer things or um unusual things that you don't see very often. I just seek what I like when I look at it. And so the things that I look at and go, that's cool. I like the look of that. I want to have that. That's what I seek personally. But I do think OPG and Venezuela cards have, have, some, have some upside if enough people stay interested in picking them up because of their rarity. All right, let me know your questions for our next episode. If you keep asking questions, I will keep answering them.